Good afternoon, uh, and to those international callers joining us, good evening. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Sober Days, How to Deter Drinking with Transdermal Technology. Uh, my name is AJ Giggler. With me here is uh, our marketing manager, Jen Mill. Good morning, Jen. Hi, AJ. Good to be here. Uh, we're going to do a brief house cleaning as we've got some other folks, it looks like, still kind of trickling in. It's just one minute after 11. Before we get started, I wanted to walk through just a, a couple of quick uh, tech items. For those of you who are new to the GoToWebinar format, uh, you may have noticed on the right side of your computer screen, you're going to have a uh, what's called a GoToWebinar control panel. It's got an orange button that you can click and expand or uh, or uh, minimize that window. What it allows you to do is, uh, at this point, because this is a, a large volume webinar, you don't have to worry about your audio controls or microphone. The system automatically mutes all the attendees. But what you do have are a couple options there to communicate with us via chat or type in a question box. Uh, there's a little, uh, it looks like a, like a little um, thought bubble. You can click on that or just go to the question section. And throughout the course of today's webinar, feel free to interact with us with comments, uh, thoughts, questions. We'll try to save most of the questions for the end of today's session. But if you have any commentary or similar experiences in some of the subject matter that we're talking about, uh, Jen's going to be fielding those questions and comments. And uh, like I said, we'll go through those throughout the course of today's webinar and make sure we get things answered at the end. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, we will be providing our contact information. We have all of yours, of course, and uh, we'll make sure we get all of your questions answered. So it's a couple minutes after. With that, we will uh, get started. As I mentioned, my name is A.J. Giggler. I am currently the Director of Product Marketing here at Alcohol Monitoring Systems. Um, just a quick background, this is now my 10th year in uh, the criminal justice community uh, supervision industry. Uh, I started uh, around 10 years ago supervising uh, a large state level electronic monitoring program. So I've, uh, I've been out in the field and had my hands on, on just about every product that's out there from alcohol monitoring to GPS tracking and home curfew types of systems. Um, for the last three years I've been working here with AMS and developing continuous alcohol monitoring programs. What we're going to be focusing on for the sake of the next 45 minutes is this concept of sober days and how we're able to deter drinking with the use of continuous transdermal technology. While looking through the attendance list, I saw a lot of treatment professionals on here, folks from sheriff's departments, probation offices, state parole, just a really a myriad of law enforcement folks that deal with the issues of alcohol misuse and crime. So we'll start things off kind of setting the stage of the role that alcohol plays within criminal justice and crime. Uh, we'll give you guys a good sense and overview of the traditional uh, testing methods that have been available historically and those that are available today. And certainly this particular webinar focuses on how SCRAM continuous alcohol monitoring kind of created this new space and, uh, and certainly is a unique uh, method for testing for alcohol and how that's really turned into just a, a tremendous deterrent uh, for those struggling with addiction throughout the course of their recovery. And then uh, I think you're going to want to walk away, many of you are going to have questions uh, about the, uh, the research, the validity, some of the court cases, legislation. Uh, there's been a lot of research studies and, and, and great outcomes that have, uh, that have been produced throughout the last 10 years that, that AMS has been in the marketplace right now with this type of technology. And uh, it certainly didn't happen overnight, so it's, it's great to have a good understanding of just how valid and legitimate this method of testing is um, uh, in the criminal justice ecosystem. So before I jump into the product, you know who, who I am and, and what the subject matter we're going to be covering today. I wanted to give those who may not be as familiar with us uh, a good sense of who we are as an organization. Uh, this is just a screenshot. I would really encourage all of you to go to alcoholmonitoring.com, our, our homepage. This is a screenshot here. Um, I think by and large, uh, we're, we're certainly advocates in every effort that's out there. And we, we join forces with other technologies, with uh, treatment organizations, with, uh, with other groups to really help in a concerted effort to reduce alcohol uh, abuse uh, and crime related to alcohol. So if you haven't signed up for Sobering Up, this is a great blog uh, that we facilitate, and we funnel in a lot of different articles from, from different sources just highlighting really the issue of combating uh, impaired driving and alcohol abuse. Uh, so it's a great resource. It's really not, not solely focused on us at all. So if you haven't signed up, please do. 
Um, but what we're probably most commonly known for in the industry is being the inventors of SCRAM, the Secure Continuous Remote Alcohol Monitor. And that's really going to be kind of the, the focal point of today's webinar and how this product is able to produce uh, what we've come to understand as sober days through continuous round-the-clock testing. Now, in addition to that, we've also uniquely uh, to this industry around, uh, around transdermal testing made ourselves very available to national transdermal uh, alcohol research. So our doors are, are open when it comes to organizations like NHTSA, you see here, uh, coming in doing case studies, third-party independent research of our technology. And the reason being is it, it was required in order for us to gain the level of court validation and, ex and scientific acceptance that we've had. So you guys will walk away today having a really good understanding of not just how this product works, how it's able to have a pretty tremendous impact on deterring alcohol consumption, but then also a lot of the, the supporting factors that have uh, led to the, the legitimacy and the validity of this technology in the court system. Uh, from a time frame I've mentioned in the last 10 years, you know, it was 2003 that Scram was first introduced to the marketplace. Uh, we, we launched a, a pilot program with the uh, Michigan Department of Corrections. They still stand as one of our largest programs on, on any given day. Uh, the state of Michigan is operating about 1,500 uh, offenders daily um, through, uh, through their parole office uh, that are on SCRAM continuous testing. But long before that, back in 1991, the very first AMS patent was filed um, after the inventor um, uh, had a, a personal tragedy, he worked in the alcohol fuel cell industry, and his college roommate uh, was killed by a drunk driver. And it was, uh, it's, it's a very inspiring story, but it's, it, was a, it was a terrible tragedy that led an engineer who worked in this industry to say, you know, there has to be a better way. There has to be something that can deal with this issue of, of monitoring for, for alcohol, this substance that, that can do so much damage yet is in and out of people's systems so quickly that it's so difficult to monitor for, uh, for total abstinence. So that's really kind of the uh, the short history of the company, very rapidly, as you see in this timeline, uh, within the first three years, Scram was quickly adopted by 40 states, which is just incredible. We had years of over 270% growth in the first four years. Today, uh, we're in 49 states. Uh, last year, we had reached our 1 billionth alcohol test milestone, and it was at that point, after a meeting uh, with the uh, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, the NIAAA, that this concept of sober days uh, was originated. Now, before I get into the subject of sober days, what those are, how we quantify those, I want you to think back to what it must be like to be a company that comes out with a technology that detects alcohol through the skin and tries to introduce it to the criminal justice system that, that very much is pragmatic, is looking for a, a reliable, valid product that wants proof. We spend a lot of time proving that this product works and proving that this is a way to catch people. This is a device that will notify you when people drink. Now, while all that is true, what we found in 2012, looking back at 10 years of data, was the compliance from the participants who wore this device. The deterrent factor was so tremendous that the NIAAA looked at us and they said, you know, this needs to be looked at more as a, a tool that drives and proves sobriety rather than, than, than pushing it as a, a product that merely catches people doing bad things. While both are certainly true, we started really to have a different perspective on just the positive impact that this product has. So I wanted to illustrate that a little bit for the audience today. Um, so let's first define again, well, what is a sober day? And we use this term because I think it's, it's fairly obvious that a 24-hour period in which a person under monitoring supervision that we can definitively confirm has not consumed alcohol, and they've not attempted to tamper with the device to try to circumvent that monitoring. That is a sober day. And the way our technology works, and you're going to learn that throughout the course of today's session, we can definitively prove to your department, your court, your ecosystem, that a participant under your program maintained a full day of sobriety. And those are quantifiable over the course of their terms uh, under your watch. Uh, now, because of the method of transdermal testing is continuous. It's around the clock, 24-7. Um, it's the only way at this point that you can have that level of certainty that someone has remained sober for an entire 24-hour day. So because you've got this round-the-clock monitoring, of course you want to uh, ensure that it's a scientifically accepted type of testing and that it's court-validated so that you're not bringing in results 
to your courtroom that aren't going to hold water within the scientific community or have any sort of uh, legal backing behind them. So I've got a little bit of a visual aid here to kind of put into perspective this, this story I mentioned a moment ago. And we, we met with the NIAAA in 2012, and they asked us about our success rates on the product. And you can see at the top of the screen here, it says 80% compliance and 99.3% sober days. Now, uh, up until 2011, we had really focused on that left figure, 80% compliance. We were tracking people who were drinking and then logging all the people who weren't drinking their entire time on our program. So we went into the NIAAA pretty proud, and, and they asked us what our compliance figures were, and we said 80% compliance. That means out of everybody who's worn a scram bracelet, 80% of those people did not consume alcohol, and they did not tamper with their device. They were 80% of them compliant. And so the NIAAA said, well, tell us about the 20%. What about those people who, who relapse? Because relapse is a very, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a strong reality in the recovery process that we have to be able to deal with, we have to expect, we have to understand, and we have to continue to work through. What can you tell us about the 20% of the people uh, who had a relapse during uh, their time on SCRAM? And we, we kind of looked at each other, and we really didn't have any analytics or any figures around the people who were noncompliant. And when you come from the world of breath alcohol testing, which really has to be done while someone's under the influence of alcohol, like a, whether it's a roadside check or a, uh, a breath test at a probation department or even a remote device in the house that tests, you, you typically have to catch somebody in the act of drinking to confirm that. So we, we didn't just consider them. They were compliant or they were noncompliant. So we went back to the lab and we looked at 10 years worth of data, 280,000 plus people monitored across the country, and we started to dive into what are those people, uh, what was the behavior like when they were uh, non-compliant? So this is a, a bit of a graphic that shows uh, what that, that population went through. Now, while some are certainly longer and others are shorter, the average uh, SCRAM sentence uh, issued by most jurisdictions is approximately 98 days. So we've had people on for a year, year and a half, some two years that are serious repeat uh, DUI offenders, others that are on for 30 days, 60 days, but by and large the average is a 98-day sentence on SCRAM. So what that means is out of every 100 people who wore SCRAM, the, the figure on the left is pretty easy to figure out. 80% of them, 80 out of the 100, won't drink at all for that entire 98 days. That's full 80% compliance. What was really amazing for us to see, and we had this data all along, when we looked at the 20 who did drink out of that group, they were still amazingly sober, 96 out of those 98 days. So when we went back to the NIAAA and told the story, they said, so you mean to tell us that these high-risk, hardcore drunk drivers on your program, those who, who often were blackout drunk day in and day out, even those who who relapsed while on your program, they still had this level of sobriety, 96 out of 98 days. So we, they went back and they said, you need to look at this from a full sober day perspective. How many sober days are you producing for these courts and agencies? And we went back and we looked at the 280,000 people who'd worn our bracelet across the 98 average days, across all the days. And 99.3% of the days that people were on our product there were no consumptions, no tampers with the product at all. And so this has kind of spun a, really a new perspective on not just looking at this product as a way to catch people, but as really a tremendous deterrent to people who need help, who need assistance in abstinence while they're getting help in a treatment program under supervision by counties and states. Uh, we, we really are not a silver bullet for curing alcoholism, but we are a tremendous complement uh, to people who are in treatment and getting help. So in summary, why is that important? You know, if, if you can basically forecast and implement that level of widespread sobriety across a particular uh, demographic of, of higher risk alcohol offenders, why is that important? Well, because it's, what we do know is not happening on a sober day is impaired driving. We know that people aren't drunk and disorderly during a sober day. We know these people aren't going to be involved in alcohol-fueled violence uh, and crime. Um, and so these are, these are big behavior change factors when, when you're looking at reducing recidivism, when you're looking at um, prolonged sobriety as an, an effort to get people back on the right track. So I hope this really kind of sets the stage for 
for the, the outcome and the impact that we're really seeing continue to grow across the country. And, and rather than looking for ways, uh, you know, again, to, to just monitor and catch people, um, more and more courts and counties that are implementing this program are doing so because they're responsible for outcomes. They're responsible for, uh, you know, reporting back to their, to their state, to their county at the end of a, of a year and saying, here's the number of people we monitored, here's how compliant or non-compliant they were, um, here's the number of relapses, here's, here's what our recidivism rates look like. So um, we're being more broadly adopted by folks who have big concerns with long-term sobriety and, and compliance within their programs. Now, many of you who are uh, registered and attending today's webinar have also downloaded <clears throat> on our website the five obstacles to alcohol monitoring. We host another monthly webinar. I encourage you guys, you can download a recorded version on the website. It's not very product focused at all, but it really just addresses the five main obstacles to monitoring for alcohol, uh, alcohol metabolism, that, that quick rate of consumption and then uh, metabolism burning off of the system of alcohol. It's, it's really the, the key to why it's so difficult to ensure abstinence uh, when, you, when we're, we're spot checking people for, for breath testing periodically. Um, behavioral patterns, the cost versus the risk. It's really great information there on, on how to develop programs, how to find funding for programs, justifying the need, and just having a really good understanding on, uh, on the issues uh, in dealing with, uh, with, with alcohol addicted uh, participants. So now, as I saw, uh, we've got a lot of uh, criminal justice professionals today. These figures really are not going to be new to a lot of you, but I, but I think it does help frame this issue and kind of set the stage. Um, I believe that um, the uh, Century Council just released 2011 and 12 numbers, but in, in 2010, sadly, 10,228 people lost their lives in alcohol-related fatalities. Uh, that number I see, I believe, went down into the 9,000 range. We're continuing to make prof uh, progress as a group, which is fantastic. Um, as, a, as, a, as a whole, in the U.S., there's just over about 900,000 DUI convictions a year. And um, sadly, 70% of the people that are involved in fatal crashes have a BAC uh, close to twice the legal limit in the, in, the in the U.S., so that's above 0.15 here in the States. Um, these other issues around supervising people, again, not a, not a big surprise. Three-quarters of domestic violence cases that exist in the U.S. Uh, are folks who are under the influence of alcohol when they have these. So it's just a huge proponent, not just in domestic violence and, and impaired driving, but really in all crime. This was a, a figure done by, uh, by BJS in 2006 that showed that more than half of the total inmate population in the U.S were what were deemed alcohol-involved inmates at the time of their crime. That means that alcohol was a factor in them either committing their initial or, or reoffending uh, crimes. Now, to get a perspective on the, the population, the entire uh, number of folks that we have to deal with and, 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 and reintegrate in society in criminal justice here, um, FBI Crime Stats 2010 show there's approximately 7.2 million supervised people in the United States uh, 2.8 million of those are alcohol-related offenses. These are your, your DUI, your domestic violence, uh, public intoxication. Those international callers who are on board, uh, we're starting new programs in the UK, Scotland, um, Australia, New Zealand have just started programs with us, and, uh, and their, their main concern is drunken disorderly, just a huge violence and public order issue around alcohol. So um, the implications are, are, are pretty widespread. So when we file it back down and look at who is it specifically that we're looking to target with this level of continuous alcohol monitoring, who can we have the biggest impact on? We need to look at who's having the biggest impact on fatalities and alcohol-related crime. Now there's a term that's becoming more widely used uh, uh, to define this specific uh, population of offender called the hardcore drunk driver. And there's a certain um, list of static factors that we can see that identify these people who continue to wind up and are, are most largely responsible for the human cost out on our roadways. These are people who continuously drive with a BAC or a BRAC of at least 0.15. These are repeat DUI offenders. We, we had uh, an interview with a gentleman who was sober for a year and a half uh, after being on our, on our bracelet in, in a program and he had 11 DUI arrests. I mean, so these, these aren't your, your mon pa kettle first time with a, with a low-level BAC DUI. These are repeat offenders who are continually um, in front of our, our courtrooms with repeat uh, arrests. They are highly resistant.
resistance and behavior change. They've been involved in multiple crashes. And we find out that it's the same type of people that are continuing to, to cycle through this. Uh, these same folks are nine times more likely to have prior DUI arrests than last year. Now, I mentioned the number of fatalities has gone down by over 1,000 uh, annually in the last three years, so that the, the group effort, the concerted effort around alcohol supervision and treatment has just been fantastic. But despite the progress that we're seeing, these hardcore drunk drivers, because they're so resistant to behavior change, these are the ones that we're still trying to focus this level of supervision on. They make up only 1% of drivers on weekend nights with that level of BAC, but they're involved in 70% of the fatalities. Um, on our roadways. So this is a very specific population that we're looking to make sure we continue to have uh, as continuous uh, level of monitoring and treatment as we can. And they're 385 times more likely to have a past conviction. Now as I mentioned, we're a for-profit company. We're a manufacturer that develops a product uh, that serves this market and helps deter drinking. So I don't want to give the impression that this is a, 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 a phrase and a, a definition that we're creating um, this has really been a consensus from organizations like the Century Council, NHTSA, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, uh, AAA, and the Traffic Injury Research Foundation. You know, all have similar definitions and statistics around this high-risk um, group of, of individuals, these hardcore drunk drivers. So now that we've kind of set the stage for uh, the, the crime, the issues that we're looking to prevent, the overall population of offenders, the number of, uh, the, the high number of, of alcohol-related offenses. Let's take a look at what those hardcore drunk drivers, those highest risk folks that we're the most concerned about make up. So as I mentioned there's about 900,000 DUI convictions a year. This filters down from the approximate one and a half million DUI arrests that happen annually in the U.S. Now when you look at the 900,000 convictions uh, on these DUI offenders, staggeringly 70% of those uh, fit this criteria of the hardcore drunk driver. And this, these are figures from the Century Council. That's over 600,000 people a year. Now, when we look at what we're doing with them on a community level, only 23% of them are under any form of alcohol monitoring once they're released back into the community. Now, this isn't just us. This is, this is SCRAM, but it's also ignition interlock systems, devices that are attached to the car to prevent the vehicle from starting, um, in-home breath alcohol testing, twice daily breath testing or random breath testing within a probation or sheriff or, or courtroom. So there's only 23% of these people approximately that are being supervised. And those are surprising figures to a lot of our attendees. Um, the portion that we handle actually went up. It was 7% in 2011. In 2012, we monitored about 11% of these offenders. So um, while there's still a tremendous amount of work to do, we, we are keeping a, a strong eye on those that uh, the, the, the organizations that are using our product find their most high-risk alcohol offenders. So what are the other options that are out there? Because again, as much as, as we're talking about continuous transdermal today, uh, we work in concert with a lot of other technologies and programs like South Dakota's 24-7 Sobriety Project. Um, they utilize twice daily breath testing, but then they also have continuous alcohol monitoring for participants who can't commute in and meet with a, uh, an officer uh, a day, every day to, to take their breath testing uh, or they can't test remotely, or those that have blown hot and they use this as an additional sanction. So we see uh, our product used quite often as a ratchet up, ratchet down uh, level of graduated sanctions. Uh, but from a cost and risk standpoint, from the low end to the high end, you obviously have jail and incarceration here on the far left being the highest cost and, and of course the highest level of supervision. On the far right, Ignition Interlock is one of the more affordable products that's out there and certainly has made a tremendous impact on reducing um, uh, road fatalities of impaired drivers because these products prevent cars from starting by impaired drivers. So we, we run a number of programs uh, where SCRAM devices are used on participants and then these, these same participants also may have an ignition interlock system set in their car. Um, there's a, another slide I'm going to cover how a number of states, a growing number of states, are utilizing um, continuous alcohol monitoring like SCRAM as a way to close some loopholes on their statewide ignition interlock legislation. So we're really excited to be a part of that. Um, you know, the downside on ignition interlock testing though is that it only monitors the vehicle. It does not prevent a participant from not driving that vehicle and say driving another vehicle intoxicated 
or not driving at all and continuing to abuse alcohol. So we all kind of play our roles, but they do have vital roles respectively where they are placed. Now working your way up the chain, you'll see there's random testing. That's been the most historically traditional method. Uh, there's a number of systems out there that use color codes or automated telephone systems to ask folks to report to offices on certain days for random testing. You typically see those for lower level uh, offenders who maybe a judge or, or, or probation department doesn't deem as being that high risk of a concern to have a level of continuous monitoring. As you work your way up, you see more frequent breath testing whether it's supervised and now there's, there's more mobile products that can do remote testing multiple times per day. Uh, but even those uh, can't, continue, uh, can't continuously monitor somebody. They can't ensure uh, that somebody wasn't drinking in between those tests or after those tests just because of the rapid rate that alcohol uh, can make it into your system and then metabolize out. Uh, alcohol biomarkers, uh, we see a growing use of these, uh, the products like ETG, ETS that test for urine and look for uh, bioindicators of the consumption of alcohol. What first started out as 24 to 48 hour uh, time frames of detection are now claiming they get back from 50 to 80 hours. Uh, and while they're still tough to stand on their own in court as a, as a quantifiable uh, confirmed indicator of consumption, uh, they are making great strides. Um, speaking of confirmation, what is great about the continuous alcohol monitoring product, and you're going to learn this in the next couple slides, because it replicates the same methodologies that are used in breath testing, uh, it's established itself a footprint of court validity. So what that means is the data that you receive from a SCRAM bracelet is valid and holds up in court just as strong as a positive blood test or a positive urinalysis test for drugs or alcohol. There's no need for secondary testing. It, is, it has what's called single source admissibility. Uh, and then on the, on, on the probably the more extreme end, we're, we, you know, we see the use of pharma injectables, substances like antabuse that att attempt to reduce the cravings uh, for alcohol. And, and in some cases, there are chemicals that are, are being worked on that create a, uh, a negative physical response when the participant uh, consumes alcohol. So hopefully this sets the stage really for, uh, at this point, probably the main options that are, that are available out there for alcohol testing. And again, I mentioned this newer category of, of mobile uh, breath testing, which is a great convenience for, for lower risk offenders. We're actually uh, just releasing a product uh, for that low risk population ourselves. If you guys get a chance to check out our website, there's more information on that. So to kind of put into a visual perspective what I was talking about in that, that rapid uh, met metabolic rate of alcohol, this is a visual that shows a, a person who's getting Let's count these, one, two, three, four breath tests, um, and they're, they're, they're started drinking at, at 8 p.m. And you can, you can call this one, two, three, four within a day, you know, and this would be uh, two in the morning there. So three breath tests, and you've got an 8 p.m. test before bed. Uh, you can get twice the legal limit in an evening and still be sober by the time you take your morning test. That's just how rapidly alcohol can get in and out of your system. So while there is a certain degree of confidence with, with lower risk people on random, even remote breath testing, those that we are the most concerned about with, um, with relapse, uh, really the only way to ensure complete 24-hour sobriety is through complete 24-hour testing. So in this same example, we see how SCRAM's uh, every 30-minute testing catches the entire drinking event, not just one detection of alcohol, but we see the event come through in its entirety from start to finish. So now you know kind of the time frames and the differences between the products out there. Here's a look at really the, the landscape that this technology is operating on. Uh, many of us have, have probably a general understanding that the liver plays a big role in metabolizing alcohol. Um, and it does. 95% of the alcohol that's consumed is metabolized by the liver completely before it goes out through the urine. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that 5% approximately of the alcohol we drink uh, is excreted unchanged to the body. About 4% of that comes out through the lungs and the kidneys detected through the blood. And then about 1% of that actually escapes through every pore in our body completely unchanged uh, as it passes through the system. Now that 1% of perspiration is what is being tested by the SCRAM device. Now, uh, what a lot of people don't know as well is that scientific research goes back as far as the 1930s that supports 
um, the levels of alcohol present in sweat, whether it's gaseous sweat, which is constantly coming out of your body, or liquid sweat, which is present when we're at high heart rate and exercising, that the percentages of alcohol present in the sweat are commensurate with the levels that are present in blood and urine and also in breath. So the inventor of this product was aware of that science, and what he acknowledged was, if you think about it, what had, had been uh, lacking was an apparatus that can gain and gather a controlled sample of sweat. Because let's look at the other methods that we test for alcohol. With breath tests, we're using a breath tester and getting a controlled sample of air from the lungs when the participant blows into that device. Easy enough to get a controlled sample. With a blood test, we're drawing a quantity of blood and we're testing that blood for its parts per milliliter of alcohol. So easy enough to get a blood sample. With a urine test, the same thing. We have a, a cup of urine and that urine is tested for its concentration of alcohol. What hasn't existed before SCRAM was an apparatus that can consistently and continuously gather a controlled sample of sweat. And therein lied the challenge in designing SCRAM. So what you're looking at right now is a cross section of the bracelet itself. Uh, if you can see my mouse, what I'm, I'm covering here is the uh, part of the bracelet that actually rests up against the participant's leg. So this is the inside if it were to be cut in half. And what you're seeing here is what we call the faceplate. It's, a, it's a, a plastic chamber and it snaps into the device and it has a perforated uh, membrane that allows air and liquid in but not out. So this will actually gather the, uh, the gaseous sweat from a wearer every second of the day, actually. It's constantly filling up with air. A lot of folks have the misconception that Scram lies there dead for 30 minutes and then wakes up briefly, sucks a, a puff of air from the leg, tests it, and then goes back to sleep. That's not the case at all. This thing actually is filling constantly with air from the participant's body. It's then, after a 30-minute uh, time frame has gone by, a pump will draw this concentrated controlled sample of air that has come from the body, really no different than the air that would be coming from the lungs and blowing into a breathalyzer. That pump then takes that air through this little sample inlet and it blows it across the same Draeger fuel cell. And you may have, be familiar with the name Draeger. They're one of the more widely used fuel cells in criminal justice. So if you were to you go to any sheriff's car and crack open their, their breathalyzer devices, most of them have a Draeger fuel cell uh, embedded inside of them. So what happens, that air is passed by that Draeger fuel cell, no different than in that roadside sobriety check. The reading is recorded and the air is expelled out through the bottom of the device, leaving the chamber empty and the process starts all over again. Um, I love to go over this slide with folks who are, who are new or learning about the product because uh, for me, it was a real light bulb moment. moment. I, I had thought there was some sort of magical chips and sensors that were working, and I, I go, well, I, I'm not sure I understand how this, this concept actually works. But after seeing this, it was a, it was a big help for me to, to see that it was, it was based upon an existing valid technology and that there was just a tremendous amount of effort that went into it to ensure that there was an external detection and that we were able to uh, tell when people were trying to circumvent the system. I'm going to get to a couple of those in a minute, but uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, which is great, it's an advancement we made about, about six years ago, uh, was that we added in the ability for the fuel cell to actually do what we call a pre-fire test. So before this pump draws the air from the collection chamber and takes a reading, literally about a second before that, it fires off and tests the ambient air around the device. So when we get into the next couple of slides, I want you to remember back to this because we're going to talk about just how specific the levels of alcohol look uh, coming out of the human pores. But we don't just rely upon that curvature of consumption and burn-off. We also can, can pretty uh, definitively rule out that there was environmental alcohol with that pre-fire test because we expect a 0, 0.0 on that pre-fire every time. If we see a positive reading in that pre-fire, then we know that there was ambient or environmental alcohol contributing to that. So in summary, utilizing this controlled sample delivery, having a Draeger, the most proven and commercially used fuel cell as a, as a core component of the device, has really helped lead us to have what's called the single source admissibility. These results stand on their own. We have some participants who live remotely and they come and report to, a, 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 say, a parole office once every two weeks to take a, a urine test. 
and they will uh, they don't have a home phone line or any cellular coverage in their area so our device can actually store up to five six weeks worth of data and a participant can come into your office sober as a judge but if they had a, a consumption event two weeks prior three days prior um, it'll be in the bracelet and we have a simple slip on device called a direct connect it connects to any internet accessible computer and that positive consumption is valid in court as a positive UA is. So it's really, a, it's just a great uh, way to have that level of confidence around alcohol testing as you do with drug testing when people report to your office for those periodically. Now in addition, we don't just leave you out there on your own. We've prepared and supported over 1,600 court cases and we've been upheld in every state that we've been challenged. I mentioned a number of research uh, studies that were done independently. Um, we are peer reviewed and it's scientifically accepted products. So we're gonna give you guys some links to those studies in a, in a short overview briefly. Here's a, a couple of graphs we're going to get into now what the device uh, is, is looking at and what the readings uh, look like when we do see confirmed consumption. Um, in a nutshell, there's three things that are happening with every 30-minute test that's conducted. Now, I mentioned air is constantly being gathered and collected by the, the faceplate, but in that 30-minute interval, three things happen. We're taking a reading of the body temperature. We're taking a reading of infrared light, and this is a light that flashes against the wearer's skin and then is read back by the device. And almost like a fingerprint, our skin and our pores have a very unique reflective quality and skin tone and texture. So what this helps us identify is if somebody were to place something like say a business card or a piece of baloney or something in between the bracelet and their leg in an effort to try to block that alcohol from being detected, we see these large spikes in this blue line, which I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides. So a nice firm line like this, we see that there's been no interruption at all between uh, the skin and the bracelet. So we see that rise when there's something placed. Just the opposite, it, it will drop. But the most important line here is this black one, and this is TAC. This is transdermal alcohol concentration, which, uh, which while it is on a 30 to 45 minute delay from what is detectable in the breath, because it has to make its way through the pores, it is directly correlated to breath alcohol concentration. So for example, I'm six foot two, 240 pounds. Uh, when I start drinking, Scram begins to detect the alcohol I'm, I'm consuming within about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and then you see this entire event from start to finish. This was actually a, a live officer test we did um, at a sheriff's conference a few years back and a gentleman who was a little skeptical, uh, I propositioned him at, at the show. I said, you know, we're, we're not just talking about this. If you're uh, doubtful, I'm happy to hook you up and, and we can supervise uh, your, your drinking tonight at the hotel and then uh, we'll, we'll check out your results in the morning. And this was them. Uh, we've all been to those shows where they got the beer cart. We actually had a couple of drinks around 4 or 5 p.m. here uh, at the show itself. Um, went back, got dressed, came back out, went to dinner, had some cocktails, had some food where you can see this little dip. And then he peaked up here at uh, just below 0.1, so just over the legal limit for alcohol. And this was a live officer test. Now, by comparison, when we see environmental alcohol, it doesn't have that slow and steady rise. It goes from zero and immediately spikes, uh, and then often will either completely pin out or will burn off very rapidly. Very different looking than, than what, is, uh, what is happening within the human body. Uh, so <clears throat> this here highlights just how sensitive the system is. We can detect levels as low as 0 .001 and as high as 0 .437. Now I'm gonna go back to the previous one because what's important about uh, this 0.02 line is though, as though we can detect levels very low and finite, they're only confirmable when they're above 0.02. And that's still about two beers in an hour. So it's a very low amount of alcohol. Um, and this is true with breathalyzer devices as well. There's not gonna be a confirmed consumption uh, that'll hold up in court unless the reading is over 0.02. So we do like to indicate and make sure people are clear on the limitations of this type of technology. I met with a sheriff's office once that, that mentioned to me, um, so you're telling me a gentleman can have a beer with dinner and this device isn't going to, to register it. And I said, yeah, that's absolutely possible. And it is a limitation of this type of technology, but when you look at the benefits of what it, it can detect and you look at the demographic of client you're trying to put on this bracelet, if you have participants who can have a beer and stop drinking, they're typically not candidates who need to be monitored continuously for alcohol monitoring. So keep that in mind when we're looking at this high risk, hardcore addicted alcoholic offender that we're trying to monitor uh, when, if that becomes a concern. Um, 
So here's the infrared lines I was mentioning to you guys earlier. The, uh, the blue here takes a rapid spike, and each one of these dots is a 30-minute interval. And as you saw in the first line, that fairly low level consumption of 0 0.01, just barely over the legal limit, that lasted well over eight hours was in, in this gentleman's system. So in order to block that type of detection, you need to place an obstruction for a rather long time. So intermittent interferences aren't going to block any sort of readings. And more often than not, we actually still see alcohol consumption when somebody is attempting uh, to, to block the system with this level of, uh, say, paper towel or a, a business card. So it becomes very, very clear to us when somebody is trying to block the system. Now, I've talked a little bit about the software. What I wanted to do for just a second, and we're kind of coming up near the, the completion of today's session, I wanted to just show you guys a quick look at what the software looks like. This is a screenshot inside of our actual software, and this is that event I showed you on the, the PowerPoint slide. This is ScramNet. You can see it's got hover text that shows that at 12.34 in the morning uh, on 621, this gentleman had a 0.094% uh, blood alcohol. This was a confirmed consumption. It met our absorption rate of less than 0.05 per hour absorption and less than 0.025 burn-off, which is specific to human consumption and burn-off. So you see the complete list of data here. Now, I'm not going to go through a rigorous software training, but I just wanted to give you that screenshot to show just what our customers have access to. In addition to the software and noted notifications via email, text, etc., uh, you're also given these great non-compliance reports. So, for example, uh, after today's call, you might feel like you have a pretty firm understanding of how this system works, but you don't have to run off and feel like you memorize all that. We provide you with these great confidential reports that summarize in its entirety how this system works. It talks about the Draeger Alcatest fuel cell, the infrared sensor here. You've got all relevant data about how many days somebody's been on the program, the bracelet number, their name, their court. It describes our data interpretation process. It provides you with a graph, a graphical uh, a representation of the event in question for this violation. It will then list um, test by test all of the positive alcohol that was tested throughout the entire drinking event and their temperature and IR. Um, it will show that that bracelet strap was closed at the time. And then we've got here a, uh, a listing of the uh, exhibits that we use by comparison. So if somebody is new to the SCRAM concept and they go, well, what is this relative to? Um, you know it's directly correlated to breath alcohol, and we provide you even custom references if you have an obscure event that you want to, say, draw a comparison to, like somebody spilled gasoline on their leg or um, this was a, um, a long-term interference or obstruction event. We can pair a similar event that occurred in a lab environment. So this one was five screwdrivers done in a lab environment from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., and this was the, the chart that it represented, and they show the absorption and burn-off rate. So uh, customers just love these simple reports. They're four pages, five pages, and you can literally stand there and read them uh, to a judge, hand this over. If you need court support, um, AMS people actually can appear and fly out and testify if those things are necessary. Uh, but the level of remote testimony we provide and the court reports are more often than not completely sufficient. Um, What's led us to that level of having sufficient uh, presence in the core room I mentioned is that we've had over 12 independent outside research studies. We've now been through two by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, TURF, NCSC did a great recidivism study on us, NLECTC, and this is the University of Colorado, just to name a few. So when you open up your technology to this level of independent third-party research, um, it has garnered us a tremendous amount of court support and validity. Even though I mentioned we've been in over 1,600 individual cases, only 86 of them went to evidentiary level challenges where people said, I am challenging the technology and the science. So we've been met with what are called Fry and Daubert rulings. This means that what's being admitted in court is not junk science. And on the other side with, with Fry is that it's saying that this is a widely scientifically accepted technology and methodology. So we're very proud of that. We've had two Supreme Court rulings uphold SCRAM, one appellate court ruling. And uh, after this year, we now I gotta just update this this week, we have 14 states that have passed CAM legislation. And in this year in the open session, uh, we have six more who are passing transdermal continuous alcohol monitoring legislation. 
Um, now, I mentioned earlier, ignition interlock bills are present in just about every state in the country right now. Where we're seeing a lot of CAM getting woven in is that um, the, the compliance rate on ignition interlock installation is very low. Uh, the national average is about 30% of people who are sentenced to ignition interlocks. Only about 30% of them actually have them installed. So a lot of states, uh, New York was one, did a great job. Senator Vasily passed a bill that required anybody who couldn't come back and prove that they had their ignition interlock installed was then going to be forced to wear the SCRAM device. You were not going to escape um, a, a alcohol supervision when you're at this level of, of alcohol offense. So we love that we're a part of this, this kind of whole continuum of effort around supervision. Um, and you know, to date, what this is what this has helped uh, gain us really is is, is now they're, they're, we're the largest, most widely used transdermal monitor in the world. Uh, like I mentioned, 48 out of 50 states are using this. 90% of the counties in the U.S. Uh, that have a population of 1 million or over are all using SCRAM programs in their courts. We've had over 80% full compliance, no drinking and no tampering at all in that 98-day average, and 99.3% of the days sober days. Uh, and I, as I mentioned earlier, excited about the international expansion we're seeing uh, in the U.K., uh, Scotland, Australia, and then more recently, New Zealand. Now, I'm not going to dive too deep into numbers, but for you bean counters out there, uh, this, this uh, presentation will be made available to you. So um, uh, those of you taking notes, you can uh, feel free to know you're going to get a, a full digital copy of today's uh, presentation. I wanted to just show the difference between our overall 10-year lifetime figures and just those in the last year. Uh, a small change here has been an increased length of stay on the program. We're seeing more and more courts who are realizing that the longer they can keep people sober, the better outcomes they see and the more success they see in overall compliance through their treatment programs and their overall reentry. Uh, so as we saw our lifetime average go from 91 and in 2012 average 98, we see, we see a, a slight rise in compliance. So fully offend, uh, compliant offenders went from 78% to 83% when you see that small rise. And this one I just find amazing. Um, the average day to the first violation, for those people who do violate, uh, it was 55 days lifetime, and then in 2012 was 73 days. So even those 20% of the people who did relapse and did have a drinking event, they still went 73 days completely sober before that, that event. And again, they were they're sober 96 out of those 98 days. So we're, we're really proud of those results. Now I wanted to bring this up to kind of put in the psychological perspective of why we think this, uh, this device provides such a deterrent factor. And when you think about places that it's fairly easy to assume someone's not going to give in to drinking, we think of a, a group environment, a treatment scenario, um, a, uh, being in a probation office. You know, you're, you're not going to drink in these environments because you're, you're amongst either your peers or people who are responsible for supervising you. But where we find the greatest temptation is when we're not in these environments, those of us who are struggling with, with alcohol addiction, social environments emotional moments, um, even alone, not in a social environment. It's, it's those windows of time where there's not the sense that I'm being supervised, that I'm being watched or tested, or that there will be consequences for my drinking that SCRAM really removes. In both of these scenarios, what offenders have told us is that SCRAM provided them at least one, one way, a way to deflect uh, some, of the, um, some of the social pressure of people saying, ah, you know, you don't have a test till next week, or you don't have to see your PO till then, or come on out and drink with us. People go, ah, I got the thing on. I got the bracelet on my leg. And even when they're in a solo environment and, and really just trying to, to struggle and battle with that addiction, just seeing and knowing that device is on their leg, some people have said to us, has just been a, uh, just a huge crutch for them to, to, to muster the strength needed to, to push through treatment. So we're really honored in, uh, at the feedback that we get, and, uh, but I wanted to put that into a psychological, psychological perspective uh, around the deterrent side of things. All right, as we're getting near the close, I wanted to sum things up with some outcome studies and some research that we saw. Uh, this was a test done uh, by the Attorney General's Office in South Dakota and, uh, and the Traffic Injury Research Foundation did a bit of a study that showed uh, the absence during an entire monitoring period. Uh, and we've had tremendous success with, with SCRAM continuous monitoring. And then when we implement its optional house arrest functionality, the level of compliance in those two research uh, studies was just tremendous. Uh, compared to 55 and 29 percent uh, for ignition interlock. Now, it's an interesting correlation here, and we don't take full credit for this by any means. We're, we're only a, uh, uh, a small part of a, of a bigger effort here. But what's been fantastic in the last 10 years 
since more advanced levels of monitoring have come out, more serious legislation and, and, and cumulative efforts by law enforcement uh, to address alcohol abuse. We've seen this red line represents the number of alcohol-involved fatalities has continued to drop. Uh, and this is our level of SCRAM uh, number supervision on, on those highest risk offenders, the people who are most responsible for these alcohol-related fatalities. So we're really excited to see the, the, these numbers come down um, and the level of sobriety continue to rise. I mentioned NCSC a moment back. There was a recidivism study done back in 2009 uh, that showed by compared to offenders who were on SCRAM for less than 90 days or not at all, those who made it past that 90-day threshold, the recidivism dropped by 14% for all crimes and by 45% uh, for DUI offenders. So really just, uh, just fantastic results. Uh, that was 2009. Just this last year in 2012, one of the more recent studies came out was by the RAND organization. Dr. Bo Kilmer uh, was behind the study here covering the South Dakota 24-7 Sobriety Project. There's a link to this video in the, uh, the hard copy, the electronic copy of the presentation we're going to provide all of you today. would really encourage you guys to download that study. Uh, take a look at the brief video summary as well. One of our, uh, I think, most flagship courts out there, uh, the Honorable Michael Brace um, in Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania, I wanted to just highlight here, he gave a great little quote about just how important it is in the recovery process to establish full sobriety, to have a level of confidence that somebody is turning sober days into weeks and then into months. Um, and in his program, uh, the average length of stay is 131 days on SCRAM. He's monitored over 3,000 participants, and his total sober day rate is 99.5% sober days. And that's a program that almost runs on its own from a funding standpoint. 95% of that program is paid for by the offenders themselves. So really just a, an honor, and, and, and uh, Judge Brace has just been instrumental in, in feedback and helping us continue to improve our programs and our technology. We're also going to provide you here in closing a list of case studies. We've got over 20 of them now on our website, and here's a link. Those of you on the call who'd like to volunteer your programs to be highlighted in a, in a Sober Days case study, we'd love to hear from you, so feel free to reach out to us. But this is also here for your, uh, uh, for, for your reading and, and digesting as well. And what you'll find within a lot of these reports are figures like this, the perspective uh, from the clients that show how positive the, uh, the, the experience was. Uh, usually out of the get-go, most of our participants aren't too excited about having a device attached to their leg uh, that detects alcohol. But by the end of them, 88% of them said that they deterred their drinking. 83% um, were employed or in school the entire time that they were on our program. 80% uh, paid their restitution, their court fees, their scram fines. Because what we find is that sober people are more responsible people. They're, they're better able to maintain employment, to be responsible, to show up to court, to show up to probation when they're not abusing alcohol. And while I, I'd love to see this number continue to rise, it has gone up. Uh, fantastically, 63% of, of the participants who wear scram were in treatment during the time that they were on our program. Now, I mentioned Judge Barace's. Uh, figures around 95% offender funded. Uh, now the average cost per day for SCRAM around the country in a full service program where somebody, uh, you know, we have one of our service providers or, or even a local sheriff or probation department that's installing the devices themselves, uh, the average price that gets charged to offenders is around $12 a day. Uh, some of them are higher in $15, $20 a day, but the average cost is about $12 a day. And some folks will argue, well, that's a lot of money uh, for some alcohol offenders to be able to afford. But what's an interesting figure we learned from our exit surveys, which we provide to all of our participants, is that when we asked them how much they were drinking and how much they were spending on alcohol, they were spending over $13 a day on alcohol. So when you remove alcohol from the budget, um, they're able to more than, than cover the cost of this program if they're not spending that money on alcohol. So it's a great uh, point to, to keep in mind when you're thinking about the price barrier. And I won't read through all of these, but uh, we get a ton of feedback from participants. And I think one of the more interesting statistics is that, believe it or not, about 7% of the people who are on SCRAM right now today uh, are volunteers. They've come to us after their court-ordered time is up, and they've said, I'm not ready to go it alone yet. I'm still getting help. My court-ordered time is up, uh, but I'm not ready yet. I'd like to pay for this out of pocket. Um, others have told us, 
Um, I was in a domestic violence situation. I was, uh, you know, a, a bad parent. This is the only way that my ex-wife will let me see my kids on the weekend because it proves that I'm staying sober. She knows that I'm sober. So uh, I think the implications uh, beyond just the law enforcement capacity I think could be tremendous, but we're, we're really proud of the feedback that we get from participants who felt that we played a big role um, in their recovery process. So lastly here, I want to close with this. Um, when you know that there's a, a level of supervision out there that you can literally implement across your entire caseload, and, and can basically ensure you're going to get this level of sobriety, this 99.3% average sober days. Uh, this really allows you to implement effective behavior change on a very broad stroke across your highest risk alcohol offenders. Uh, because you're getting this level of compliance, this also actually reduces your workload. I've had a number of departments uh, that signed up with us that were nervous that this was going to create more work for them. They said, oh, we went from house arrest to GPS, and it was just so much more data. We had to manage so much more stuff. Um, and so folks that have moved from, say, breath testing over to continuous with us, they worried it would be more work. And what they didn't realize was that with so much compliance, so much sobriety, there's very little work that needs to be done because we provide you with exception reports for just those folks uh, who are drinking, just those folks who do need your, your attention. So it's, it's a great way to streamline case management. And ultimately, the goal here is that if you can drive this term, uh, this type of long-term long sobriety, uh, we're going to have a positive impact on community safety and, and overall recovery process uh, for the participants that were, were under supervision. So in closing, I'm going to see if Jen has any uh, questions from the field. Uh, if not, those of you, please feel free to contact us. This is our, uh, our website, my email address here, agigler at alcoholmonitoring.com. Uh, those of you uh, that haven't, you can find us and friend us on Facebook, get involved in the conversation. We have a Twitter, a YouTube channel with some great videos, some informational pieces out there. Uh, and certainly, uh, check out the Sobering Up blog. It's a uh, it's really, uh, you know, I think once every couple of weeks there's a great uh, stream of articles on there, uh, and, and you can certainly sign off of it if, if you don't like it, but it's just a great resource uh, for, for a lot of elements around alcohol treatment and supervision. So with that, um, I'll turn it over and ask Jen if, if there's any questions. Uh, if not, I want to thank everybody for their time today. Jen? Hey, AJ. Um, I don't have any questions. I would just like for you to remind the attendees and how they can access the information contained in this PowerPoint. Oh, um, great. Yeah, the, uh, the PowerPoint, there will actually be a follow-up email, and there will be a, a link to the PowerPoint. Um, and those of you who um, were unable to attend, if you have colleagues and the such, we've got a lot of emails. Uh, there will also be a recorded version of today's webinar made available to you. Um, and then previous ones we've already done at this same presentation are, are live on our website that you can download at any time. So uh, I want to thank Jane Mill for joining us today and all of you for taking the time out of your Thursday afternoon. Uh, come join us next month for the five obstacles of alcohol monitoring and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much.